Joseph A. Sabora here as I continue to review movies in October since it's Halloween month and it's just right around the corner next Monday which is going to be one fightful day and night where everyone gather around wearing their special Halloween costume go off for trick-or-treating as well as having a monster mash party <laughs> yeah so I'm going to be reviewing the movie that started the revolution in the zombie apocalypse. I'm talking about George A. Romero's original horror classic, Night of the Living Dead, from 1968. A story about a plague of flesh-eating zombies known as ghouls as they swarm around a Pittsburgh town, which includes a young woman named Barbara, joining in with a black man named Ben, uh, along with a young couple named Tom and Judy, and a family very struggling named Harry Cooper, along with his wife Helen and her daughter Karen. As they're about to hide out in this rural farmhouse, yeah, two of them had to hide out uh, outside of the house while the rest had to stay inside the cellar just so they could be safe from all these zombies around and hoping they'll find help from the authorities so they have TVs radios food supplies and all if they can anyway this was the movie that made George A. Romero a household name um, he started out um, at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh as he attended uh, in the film industry by directing and producing television commercials as well as uh, industrial films for a company called the Latent Image which will soon become Image 10 where he formed uh, with with nine members joining in which is of course ten members together includes uh, John Russell, his co-writer, and Russell Streiner, who's one of the stars of the movie. So they produce uh, finance to work on this one smaller budget um, black and white horror film. Romero took inspiration by Richard Madison's novel I Am Legend, all which had free film adaptations including uh, Brinson Price's Last Man on Earth, along with Charlton Heston's The Omega Man and Will Smith's of the same title, uh, I Am Legend. <laughs> Which Madison himself um, wasn't quite pleased with Romero's uh, suggestion when he first saw the movie. Um, he was pretty headstrong about this reputation, but he kind of got along with him because he, because he was a nice guy and all. But I guess that's probably what everybody felt at the time. And the reason why the film had a public domain status was because they failed to have a copyright license uh, by the distributor Continental Distribution, which would be known as the Walter Reed Organization. And that's why we have uh, numerous uh, physical media, TV airings, and streaming uh, airings available around. And, you know, everybody can even upload a copy from all these DVDs, e even though the transfers are not the best out of both worlds. But then there are ones that are much better than ever. But I'm glad uh, they exist, and I'm glad they've been saving it over the years, and and it's no wonder why this was such a cult phenomenon you know, at the time. Because this was shot in, in a small budget, too. Um, it was, which, uh, it was only like over 114,000 to 125,000, maybe even a little more. And they actually grew. Um, and actually earned its success um, after it came out in 68. So that's why we had numerous um, 
physical media copies and TV airings and all that that were available. And they even have it on streaming too. I mean, you can actually post the movie all fully on YouTube as well as um, archive.org and many other websites around. So chances are you'll be able to find copies available. And I know there have been numerous uh, duplicate copies. Uh, some of them look pretty bad. Other ones uh, look better than others. Some of them may have struggled a little bit too, even if they are digitally remastered. Um, especially the DVD that I just picked up. This one, Night of the Zombies collection. Yeah, which shows the an image of, of the zombie right here. <laughs> this one guy. And on the back you have uh, five movies. Uh, on two disc as a claim digitally remastered interactive menu yeah which just shows uh, <laughs> just just a person you know grabbing some guns and you know targeting all these zombies and they shoot them they basically shoot them in the head and seeing selections that they have like they have films like zombie hell house night of the living dead of course uh, the Last Man on Earth with Vincent Price, White Zombie with Bela Lugosi, and Revolve of the Zombies with Dean Jagger. Yeah, all included on this one set. Um, yeah, <laughs> look how it looks. Came in this thing, the sponge. I guess to clean the disc and all. Um, I picked this up at Dollar Tree for only a dollar twenty-five. So what can you do? Uh, the transfer on each of these films um, range from decent to a little bit mediocre, but you get more than what you pay for. Uh, although I would say Night of the Living Dead actually look a lot better than most of these films here. So that's interesting enough. But there have been numerous uh, VHS tapes. Uh, I I know my father had the, the public domain VHS tape. I mean, that was the first time I saw the movie at the time. And I remember being frightened by this one scene where Barbara, who just found the farmhouse all alone, you know, just to protect herself from all these zombies following her around at the cemetery, just got his brother, who will soon become one. Um, the, the scene that would terrify, and I'm sure it terrifies the audience, was when they showed this shot of, of this one dead corpse, uh, upstairs, his face already been bitten off, his entire skull face around, that was creepy, and blood was dripping too, I mean, that terrified me as a kid, uh, it would still terrify me a little bit too even as an adult, but not much. <laughs> but that was uh, a very creepy scene. So yeah, anyway, um, so yeah, we have VHS tapes, we had Laserdisc, we have numerous DVDs of any kind. There was, uh, there was a widescreen print, which was just cropped eventually, because the whole film is in full frame. It was shot this way. It was in black and white on a small scale budget and they had used their own practical effects and everything. Um, they also had this in 3D, digital 3D, on one of the DVDs and Blu-rays I believe. Uh, yeah, I think it was the Blu-ray that had it, the Blu-ray 3D. Uh, there's even one in color. They colorized it uh, when it aired on TV back in the 80s. Uh, yeah, colorization was a very big thing at the time when they were colorizing black and white movies and for primetime TV, which I know that became such a problem for, for film enthusiasts and historians and buffs around. And who wouldn't? But the audience didn't mind about it, or sometimes the audience didn't like the idea. I understand too. I'm not a big fan of having to see black and white films being colorized by a computer, which they often didn't do a very good job. 
Sometimes they may look better than others, so that's depending on it. Uh, but yeah, they colorized it by Hal Rose Studios, but they later colorized it again. They improved the quality even better. I mean, now that we have other computers and digital technology to fix this problem. So it may, it may match even better than before. But they just never get the colors right. They never get the flesh tones and skin tones uh, perfectly. That's the problem. I mean, you can tell that you can still see some black and white on each image. Yeah, well, you know. And some of the prints weren't the best out of, out of both worlds, but... And they had some film issues, too. Like, there's some skipping. Some of the scenes were spliced in together. Like, maybe they had some rougher prints. But there are some much better prints out there available, and they have ones that are definitive. And they didn't have any issues whatsoever like the the 4k restoration uh, that they use for the criterion collection release on 4k they just put it out recently they have the blu-ray release too uh, that came out a few years ago and it has all the extras included uh, all the other numerous dvds have extras too so of any kind like if you get the anchor bay release or you get the, the dimension extreme release with the digital restored image or or you get um, all these other um, companies that, that carries these I mean who knows and sometimes they even produce their own director's cut of the movie or maybe Romero's may have approved it or something like they wanted to add some extra scenes that didn't quite make it into the film you know, I, I know I, I saw one where they did it back in 1998 as, as a celebration for its 30th anniversary like they just added a, a news reporter and, and all of that I mean you can tell they just use they just use like a camcorder they film this it's almost like a film student movie as opposed to the original so I don't know how they got into it but eventually they did it <laughs> crazy I know okay um it had a big controversy at the time too. I mean, especially during the premiere. Um, I know Roger Ebert recommended the movie at the time, uh, but he also had had cited theater owners and parents to allow children to access the movie, even though because for a horror movie, it's it's not going to be easy for them to handle at a young age. I mean, there's going to be a lot of gruesome scenes here and there. This was 1968, by the way. So this is a whole different time period. Okay. And and he even talks about his experience when he first saw it in theaters and, and how he reacted to everyone. Um, and of course, um, they had the Supreme Court uh, that established the, the clear-cut guidance for for all these, uh, for all the violence they use, they claim to be pornographic. I don't understand that either. Uh, they came with different titles for the film. Um, it was going to be called Night of the Flesh Eaters, or Night of Envious, or Monster Flick. It was going to be used as like a horror comedy genre, but that never happened. But, you know, they already did that already later on with... The Return of the Living Dead, along with its sequels. Um, and I know Shaun of the Dead did one, too. And I know Zombieland and, and <laughs> Scott's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse. You, you get the idea. There's so many of them. Uh, but Romero um, would soon spawn his film career as a producer, as well as a writer and a director. You know, he went on to do films like Martin, The Crazies. He teamed up with Stephen King with uh, the first horror genre called Creep Show, which became a franchise. Um, joined in with Richard P. Wubenstein for the Royal Productions that he formed, too. And that's where he did Tales from the Dark Side, the TV series, along with Monsters, which also had um, their film... The, the feature film, uh, Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. And then, of course, he went on to direct films like uh, 
Monkey Shines. He did uh, the Stephen King adaptation, The Dark Half. And when he came back, he did Bruiser, and then he did a couple more of those uh, dead movies you know, before his death. But yes, um, Night of the Living Dead did became a franchise um, with his Dead series. Uh, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Land of the Dead, Diary of the Dead, and Survival of the Dead. All of them together. And they had remakes to follow, like the 1990 remake which had Patricia Tolman playing Barbara as a strong female character with vulnerability and all. Um, sort of a twist on, his on her character though because almost a little bit like a damsel in distress as portrayed in, in the original. But she became fully strong. She lost her sanity and all. She teams up with Tony Todd. Um, which, by the way, Patricia Tolman is a stunt woman. She was in Babylon 5, the TV series and all. Tony Todd went on to do um, Candyman, Final Destination movies. He was in The Crow. Yes, Tony Todd played Ben in the, in the role. He was terrific. Um, Tom Tykes, uh, who played Harry Cooper in the movie. Yeah, he was in the movie... Um, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer with Michael Rooker in one of his first films. And he played or oldest in that movie as his partner and friend. They're the serial killers. Uh, yeah. Which I thought it was one of the best uh, horror remakes, in my opinion. I'm glad I got a cult following over the years. Um, despite critics uh, panning it. But it got mixed reviews when it came out. So there were critics who, who really enjoyed it more than than Siskel and Ebert and everyone. So I'm, I'm glad it got, it got a better praise than before. But unfortunately, it could have been a whole lot better if it had more praise. And it's true, it should have had. Because it's trying to prove upon the original movie. I mean, just because I enjoy the remake more doesn't mean... I don't like the, the original film. That's not fair. I enjoyed the original film as a kid when I saw it. And I still enjoyed it today. No matter what. No matter what edition we have. So, of course, everybody has their own choice. But there have been worse remakes out there, too. Uh, Day of the Dead was a crappy remake. And that's the one with, um, <laughs> with Nick Cannon. So... I love Nick Cannon, though. But still. Oh, boy. Okay, I, I know I'm taking too much of my time, but let's get right to it uh, for the whole start of, of the story here. It stars Dwayne Jones, uh, Judith Odea, Carl Hartman, Marilyn Eastman, Keith Wayne, Judith Ridley, Kara Sholin, Charles Craig, Bill Heinzman, George Lasana. Russell Steiner, and Bill Cardell, nicknamed Chili Billy. <laughs> yeah, Chili Billy. Um, yep, it's written by George A. Romero, along with John Russell, and it's directed by George A. Romero. The movie began set in a rural Pennsylvania town. It could be Winslow, which is like somewhere around like several miles from there. Or it could be Pittsburgh or any other town. I know I mentioned Pittsburgh at the beginning of the start of the intro of my review. But I guess it doesn't matter which one it is. I mean, I all make we all make mistakes, though. And I know I, I probably made mistakes many times already on my channel. <laughs> okay, but you get the idea. Uh, any other town. We meet our siblings who are brother and sister named Johnny and Barbara, both played by... Russell Steiner and Judith Valdia. They drove straight to the cemetery to visit their father's grave for his remembrance. Yeah, they just sent out um, a carnation, flowers, and and a cross. Uh, they just went to church uh, before this to remember and buy. And suddenly, their car radio had shut off due to technical difficulties. Um, 
as they're about to leave with Johnny explaining that when they were kids, you know, they used to hang around this graveyard and they go around, you know, doing all these these fun games here and there, which they almost got caught. But they, they used to join in with, with their uncle. Suddenly, Johnny ends up uh, teasing Barbara and scaring her to death by saying, They're coming to get you, Barbara. They're coming to get you. And Barbara just told him, Stop it, Johnny. You're acting like a child. <laughs> As they were ready to leave, uh, they spotted a very strange, peculiar, stumbling man wearing a tatter suit. I mean, the way you spotted his uh, his face expression, you can tell how creepy he really looks. But he goes around attacking Barbara, so Johnny came around and saved her by stopping that guy, and then all of a sudden knocks Johnny straight into the tombstone, affirming that he actually killed him, or knocked him unconscious. Who knows? But Barbara eventually ran away as fast as she could, as she was totally scared and frightened. She went straight to the car, drove off as fast as she could, but then she ends up crashing straight into the tree, and then she flees straight into, and also took shelter there, at a farmhouse where she began to learn that one woman actually lived there but she was already dead yeah that's where I mentioned about the, the scene where, where um, her face is all ripped apart half eaten um, blood was dripping yeah you see the skull face I mean that was terrorizing all right yeah hard to believe that was a woman too when you saw that uh, she tried to, to call the authorities, but the phone line was, was either busy or was dead. And then by the time she hears a, a truck coming by, uh, she also grabs the knife too to make sure if there's any even more outside, which apparently, yeah, there were a few more that was coming out. And the next thing you know, she spotted a black man named Ben, played by Dwayne Jones, and he arrives by securing the farmhouse, by boarding up all the windows and doors, drives away with all the ghouls with a lever action rifle that he has. Um, yeah, he found some he found a rifle around, but he also has uh, this hook where he ends up knocking each of them around. But he also found a closet that with a fire inside and also have a block of wood so they'll be able to use it so they can be able to light up even with gas fluid because we he learned that yes um, all these zombies known as ghouls are afraid of fire so he'll be able to lighten up the chair and everything around so he can get past to it um, Already, uh, Barbara is in a state of shock. That's why she's a damsel in distress. See, unlike in the 1990 version where, yes, he was a bit of a... I mean, at first she was shocked. She was scared um, in the beginning. And then next thing you know, she lost her sanity. And she, she changes into a very strong female character. And, and she gets to fight back, joining with a group. And hoping that she'll be able to <laughs> be able to kill these zombies using all all their gunfire and all all these rifles that they have, you know, bullets, everything. So okay, but but since I'm reviewing the 1968 movie, I already reviewed that one. Let's let's just stay in, in topic here. Stay on topic. <laughs> okay. Anyway. He was also surprised that there were more people that were in the cellar when he meets uh, Harry Cooper, who's played by Carl Hardman, along with his wife um, Helen, played by Marilyn Eastman. Uh, they had their daughter named Karen, who's played by Kyra Shalin, who un unfortunately had been bitten 
by one of the, the zombies. So now she's fallen pretty ill. Um, they're joined in by a young couple named Tom. who's played by uh, Keith Wayne and Judy, his girlfriend, um, played by Judith Ridley. Anyway, both Harry and Tom had just emerged from the cellar. They had been taking shelter for a while, uh, along with, with Helen and, and Karen. So they're trying to find an emergency broadcast as, as they just heard straight from the radio. As, yeah, they found a radio. They later found a TV uh, as they had to bring it uh, from upstairs somewhere. Uh, where they begin to hear a report going around about um, a plague of, of ghouls, as they referred to, were about to head around the entire town. And now they're trying to find a place and for everyone to actually stay indoors so that way they could be safe. So they won't end up getting eaten by them and then they'll end up becoming one of them. That's for sure. So then they begin to, to change that those rules and begin to find out that you know for their own particular safety they need to find other places like hospitals and other shelters around so maybe they'll be safe over there if they can and maybe hopefully they'll find a way to to bring in some some guns you know ammo and and all to to survive and be able to shoot each of these zombies by sh yes, by shooting them straight into the head because that's the brain that controls them. So yes, they are they are dead, but they can they, but they can be alive once they move around slowly, sloshing and, and all. And you already see them, you know, already you know moving around, doing this and stuff. Uh, you even spotted them naked too. Yeah, like I spotted a naked chick on one of these scenes and all these other ones. So they're going around eating their flesh. Um, so sometimes you see like a bunch of um, intestines coming out of their bodies and all this, you know, the, the hearts, the, the lungs, uh, other body parts that they eat, eat them out. You know, they get hungry for food. No matter what. So anyway, um, so they were listening to the radio. They had reports about the a wave of mass murders happening around the corner, all of that going around. So now it was even happening on the east coast too, as opposed to the west coast. So they're trying the best they could, but as as usual, um, both Ben and Harry were. We're having a um, we're having a, a bit of a, a a rivalry. All of a sudden, they 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 keep arguing to figure out if they should stay in the cellar or they should just stay outside because it's more safer that way. I mean, whatever they can, they need to help out, board some more windows and doors to make sure you know. But they need to keep some of them in there, and they have to leave maybe one door open to make sure they'll be able to escape straight into the gas station so they'll be able to pump some gas so hopefully they'll soon be ready to go straight into the hospital or any of those places um tom and judy and ben were one of them to go straight into while harry eventually you know make makes a, a distraction to all the, the zombies around so they make sure they have to dump all that fire you know, all, all the jars uh, filled with fire that they had to light up. They even had to light up the fire on this uh, one table uh, stand. You know, they wrapped around with, with a sheet so they can... So once they threw the fire into the ground, you know, they'll be able... They'll be able to run away or move past to it. And that way they'll get there as soon as they can, but... It just ends in a disaster when both Tom and Judy died in, in a blast. Yeah, because they, they 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 poured too much of the gas straight through the truck, and when, if they light it on fire, that's they're done for. 
So Ben was all alone, and now he went back to the house. He he got so furious with uh, with Harry because you know all this because Harry was no help at all. Although he did help some of it, and he was being an asshole, of course, at times. And at that rate, uh, Ben eventually shot him too one time just when when already Barbara already in a state of shock had eventually got up I mean she's still scared but nevertheless she she eventually ends up helping um, uh, Ben out uh, try to you know barricade the the boards so to make sure that all these zombies won't come out but they're gonna be attacked anyway I mean even his brother Johnny eventually arrives, but she, he's already a zombie, so took her away. So I know she didn't do much. Meanwhile, um, already their daughter uh, Karen just uh, eventually becomes a zombie. Ends up, uh, ends up. Uh, well, even though Harry just got shot by Ben. And he went straight down to the cellar. He ends up um, getting, he's already dead, but he ends up getting eaten by a Karen. But of course he woke up and was ready to attack uh, Ben. Um, also, uh, Karen just uh, killed um, her mother, uh, Helen, by stabbing her straight in with a shovel. Yeah, one of those small shovels, brutally, and then afterwards she becomes a zombie too, so yes, they're all dead. Ben took care of it, now he's all alone, which leads to the end of the film when all the other uh, authorities and everyone else, um, they came by, they were killing all the rest of these zombies, day and night. Um, night and day as morning comes um, well this was the ending that I'm I'm not a big fan of this ending as far as I'm concerned and I, I guess people kind of felt that this was this was at the period when Martin Luther King was assassinated at the time a horrible tragedy at back then you know their, their social leader and all. Uh, there was a scene in the movie, and that's where I'm going to mention it, where they thought that, uh, that Ben was already dead, like he was a zombie, but he was actually alive all this time. He was already just down there in the cellar all alone. He already killed them. Um, Barbara's already gone. I think she's now a zombie. It's hard to believe. And then, somehow, uh, one guy just shot him in the head, because he thought he was dead. So, of course, they took his body and was ready to uh, join in with all the rest of the dead zombies and just light him up. Um, which, you begin to see, you know, background images um, in the end credits of the film. Yeah, the ending was just... I'm sorry, but I thought the ending was just was pretty stupid. Um, I know I, I it's not meant to have a happy ending. We all know that. I mean, all horror films usually always have um, unhappy endings, but sometimes they have some other ha happy endings too. But I, I can accept both a happy and an unhappy ending in its own ways, but. As long as it's done perfectly. But I just feel like, you know, the ending was just totally erupt in a bad way. And, and they just had to keep it that way. But I know. But what can you do? Um, but I still think, still, it's a, it's a horror classic. I really enjoyed it uh, when I saw this. I mean, it was terrorizing when it came out. I mean, I wasn't born when it came out, but I know my 
I don't know if my father ever saw it in in a local theater at a young age, but maybe yeah, if his if his parents had took him to see it. But I know he saw this uh, a long time ago, and and he had the VHS tape, and I saw it, and and I really enjoy the film as a zombie movie because it really shows um, how terrorizing um, having to live in a town where all these zombies appearing and they're going around eating the flesh of a human like you see all these uh, intestines coming out all this other body parts and all that stuff uh, makes it more scary than it already is and it was sure was ahead of its time too but they really for for this budget it really worked and for its story yes it's not original but that's okay I mean, you can do any movie with this particular story, and it will still be impressive. But then sometimes there are ones that are, are terrible. And then there's sometimes we have characters that are, that are not exactly who they are. But, but if you think of it this way, it's sort of like this was exactly what we're preparing for. It's like a war. You know, it's a... It's indeed a mass hysteria of uh, biblical proportions here, in some ways. Okay, I, I'm sort of borrowing like almost quotes from <laughs> from Ghostbusters, but no. But you know exactly what's going to happen. I mean, there's there's always going to be like all these diseases happening around. I mean, already with this COVID nineteen going around the pandemic. It's epidemic, I mean, AIDS happening, or or there was this swine flu, or there, then there's also a Spanish flu before that. And I know there's always a revolution of any war going around. I mean, this, this was um, a template for that. That who could have imagined what could happen to you if, um, if you somehow got infected? that you'll end up becoming one of them and you're going to end up eating their flesh you know just to survive in a way it's very gruesome as it seems but um, the characters um, I, I know it's, it does seem nihilistic at times when, when you see all these uh, gruesome death scenes here and there but anyway um, I mean, for its nature and all, but the characters for the film, they're portrayed exactly what we expected. I mean, if we were, if we interacted with them, we, we knew exactly what we had to do in this particular life and death situations. We had to struggle to survive. We had to try to get our protection, you know, to stop all these, um, all these waves of mass murders happening with all these zombies and all that that's what's gonna happen I mean you need you need guns you need you need any kind of rifles or any other kind that you have you need food and water supplies all of that to survive and hoping that soon we'll be able to have maybe their own world of, of their own and maybe they'll hoping there might be a cure to, to stop this uh, madness this happen if this ever happens but that was the case of what the zombie apocalypse had to cure yeah okay but if you think of it this way without night of the living dead we would have never had so many movies to follow afterwards but i i know um the last man on earth and all these other films came before it so we need to have a revolution. But George A. Romero did a great job directing, producing, and writing the script uh, with John Russell. They really, they really captured the spirit of them all. They know what they were doing. Um, I love um, the look of being shot in black and white. I mean, the sound quality is indeed intense. 
you know, they had a soundtrack uh, with this, this eerie score that they used. I mean, there are times when it almost looked like this movie would have been shot in the 40s or 50s, but it's, but it's really the late 60s. The performances, give or take, are actually superb. Uh, specifically, Dwayne Jones, because this is indeed one of the rarest movies to actually have an African-American to play the lead. I mean, this was in the 60s, by the way, just so you know. But he is indeed a strong character, hoping that he'd be able to find ways to, to stop all these ghouls and all. But it's going to be a lot difficult than he can imagine. But anyway, even though, yes, he had to argue with Harry, because Harry is just, you know, he wants to have his own authority. Like, he, he wants to become the boss by having them stay in the cellar while they can stay indoors. But he's suggesting that this was a bad idea. I mean, cellar is more safer that way, but I know they have their own authorities too. Even if, I mean, hopefully this is not a, an a racial thing or anything like that, but, but they have to do whatever it takes. Um, but anyway, all, all the rest of the actors were good, too. I mean, no doubt about it. But sometimes it, it takes a while to get used to them. It almost felt like, like this could have been a student film in some ways. And that's what really makes it so special. Nevertheless, I mean, it's still, still the greatest uh, movie ever made uh, for the zombie apocalypse. Anyway, that's Night of the Living Dead, and I give the movie four stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.